studio with us today. We're going to discuss his book. The book is The Ominous Parallels, the author, Leonard Peikoff, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, and uh, we're going to talk about it. Uh, I've uh, read parts of it, as I told you, and uh, I look forward to finishing it. You have uh, got some uh, very provocative thoughts in it, and I uh, want to take a look at that. Uh, we, uh, from time to time, even on this show, and just for background, because we take a look at a lot of things uh, in the news and in the world, and sometimes we dabble back into history a little bit, and I'm of the opinion that we often look at little bits and pieces of what's going on around us, and little bits of history and events, and sometimes fail to see how they relate. Uh, and there is a relationship, and I feel there is no irrelevant event. And so even the title of your book fascinated me, the Ominous Parallels. <laughs> so you have seen some parallels in history I, yourself. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I uh, worked on this book many years, and I found what I think are strikingly frightening parallels in every key field, in politics, in economics, in art, in culture, but most basically in philosophy. The Germans uh, were taught certain ideas for decades that ripened them for Hitler. And those same ideas I hear taught all the time in our leading colleges and universities, as I know from years of experience teaching college in this country. If I could strip it down to two words, unreason and self-sacrifice. Should I elaborate? Yeah, if you yeah. like, yes. Uh, by unreason, I mean the rejection of logic. The idea you should accept conclusions on the basis of divine revelation or instinct, intuition, emotion, something non-rational. If so, people are ready to be whipped up into an emotional frenzy by a potential uh, demagogue, and they've thrown away uh, their <laughs> own... Freudian slip. Yeah, <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> said the Republicans are basically the same. Okay. Uh, they've thrown away their only weapon of challenging him, which is called calculating thought, logic, reason. The Germans certainly had this instilled in them, and so are American college students having it. The other idea is self-sacrifice. If you teach people your justification in life is service to others, it's wrong to pursue your own happiness, you are nothing, you're just a member of the community which should tell you what to do, then, of course, the dictator steps up and he says, I'm the voice of the community, here's what you have to do. And if you say, but it makes me unhappy, he says, that's the whole idea, you're supposed to suffer for mankind or the state or whatever it is. Uh, this, to me, is the root of all the other parallels. Let me, let me go back to, uh, for a little background for, for those uh, of our listeners who may not uh, remember. I hope that they do remember Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand, uh, of course, was the authoress of uh, things like Atlas Shrugged, Fountainhead, uh, We the Living, Anthem. And uh, she had uh, some philosophies that you agreed with. And uh, as a young man, you, you read uh, Fountainhead. Yes. You became I, interested I in her philosophy. You met with her. You knew her. I met her 32 years ago, right. actually. 31 years ago. And I was associated with her for all the time till her death this year. So a lot of the kinds of ideas that, uh, that you're uh, uh, talking about in your book uh, might be familiar to, uh, to uh, readers of and admirers of. Uh, Ayn Rand. Oh, yes, and she was kind enough before her death to write an introduction to my book. Yes, I was going to say, she did, and uh, was very complimentary, and uh, she apparently uh, is the only book that she's ever approved of, the only objective is particularly, that she's ever uh, uh, endorsed, if you please. Yes, I think that's true. So, uh, tell me just a little bit about, uh, and I know this is not about her, but I'm fascinated with her, never met her. Uh, how did you evaluate her on just a personal one-to-one -one basis? Well, when I first met her, I was 17. I was in pre-med. I didn't know anything about philosophy and had some questions, yeah. and I was just simply overwhelmed by the logic of her answers and by the passion with which she delivered the answers and by the detail. Uh, I would ask a question expecting a one or two sentence answer, and she would give a speech telling me not only the answer, but what questions I would think of tomorrow <laughs> and what the answer to them were, and what confusions in my thought had led to my problem to begin with, and it was really a tour de force. And after that, I was so taken, really, I was taken with her conviction, first of all, that philosophy is a science. It's not a matter of opinion. There are objective answers. And secondly, that it makes a difference, that it's not just empty talk. It really moves men, determines human life, takes the course of history. And that combination, after a little while, made me think I better give up pre-med, which I wasn't too interested in anyway, and go into philosophy, well, which she, I did. She had uh, an associate, was it Brandeis? 
Brandon many Brandon. years ago, yes, but uh -huh. they, didn't, they haven't seen each other for a Right, minute. but that for a while he was almost a protege, in but a they had a little philosophical falling out, yes, as I understand. Did. Didn't yeah. know whatever happened uh, uh, to him. Uh, not to, to go too far with her, I'll ask you one more question about her, okay. because I because I got you. Sure. You're the only man I ever met that knew her. Uh, in, in her writings, particularly in uh, Atlas Shrugged and in Fountainhead, uh, which I thought were very clear and crisp and beautiful works, after reading them, I, I thought that I detected a lack in her that I could only describe as compassion. Uh, and, of course, in the philosophy, compassion is something you don't owe to anyone. Uh, you decide whether to express compassion or not. You are not your brother's keeper. I understand that. But in a one-to-one -one personal relationship, did you, did you sense much of what you would call the characteristic of compassion? Well, it would have to be defined. If you okay. mean sympathy for someone in trouble through no fault of his own, that's the crucial thing. Then I think she was extremely compassionate. If I had a problem and went to her with it, you know, she was uh, like a parent. She would do everything. She was generous. She was understanding. She would give advice, etc. But if she thought you were in a problem through your own deficiencies, through your own, you know, culpable error, through your own fault, she had no compassion at all. She used to say she was a champion of justice and she would never give the unearned, neither unearned wealth, nor unearned admiration, nor unearned sympathy. So compassionate depends. Depends, was it earned or not? All right, now let's get into the book now because uh, we, we've set the stage. Uh, Dr. Leonard Peikoff is the author. Uh, Ominous Parallels is the title. We're talking about parallels that you see between the years prior to uh, the formation of uh, the Nazi Party, right. uh, its formation, and the, uh, the movement of Hitler, and you see parallel to that some of the things that are going on oh, today yes, in this country. A number of parallels between Germany in the 20s and the United States today. I mean, even much more practical parallels than just, uh, given the basic philosophic similarities, I've, I've touched on them, but there are a lot of much more concrete parallels. Look at the political situation, for instance, as just one. We have a division in this country between liberals and conservatives, which is the only choice we're basically given. And uh, this is the same exact type of choice that the Germans were given in the 20s. And if you look at them, you'll see they're just two variations on the same theme. It's a false alternative that this is our only, only two possibilities. Look, the liberals ask for more economic controls, more controls of business, more welfare, more taxes, more Social Security, etc. President Reagan and the moral majority come into uh, the, the uh, eminence. And they say this is wrong. And then they offer as their alternative a whole constellation of moral and intellectual controls, thought control to be legislated by the federal government, prohibition of abortion, government censorship of literature, you know, for so-called obscenity, government telling us how biology should be taught in the schools, one thing after the other, a legislated prayer in the schools. We have two groups posturing as opponents, and one says the solution to our problems is more government, the other says that's wrong, the solution is more government. Hitler had the <laughs> same situation in the 20s. He said, gentlemen, you're both right, let's have total government. And so he stepped in and offered them... Uh, he said, I'll give you I'll give you what both sides give you, absolute government control. And they got it. And they got it. And, now, and whatever gets in here, are Republicans or Democrats, what new right or new left, they don't care what you call it, the one thing they want to do is have more government. Now let's go, go back again because you're drawing some parallels between uh, uh, two different uh, periods in history, two different uh, governments, two different countries, uh, and you're seeing some similarities. Yeah. Uh, and from what I've read in the book, I, I, I can see some of those overtones. Uh, the, the book itself uh, uh, is subtitled The End of Freedom in America. Uh, you utilize the use of a, a swastika to uh, well, superimpose, all right, yeah. superimposed uh, over uh, a part of the, of the jacket itself. And people associate Hitler and Nazism with one basic thing. They remember the, uh, the effort to exterminate the Jews sure. in Germany and in Europe. And that's principally what they remember about it. But I suggest that, that most people do not know anything about the politics uh, and the uh, economics of Germany that laid the groundwork and made that possible. Well, I agree with you. Uh, in your implication, anti-Semitism was an aspect of Nazism in Germany, but in my opinion, that was merely one aspect. In, in Mussolini's uh, Italy, for instance, it was not a particularly 
prominent aspect, and that is by no means the essence of Nazism. You know that at the end, as Hitler had started to exterminate all the Jews, he was moving very rapidly to the Poles and the Ukrainians and many other groups. Uh, he wanted slaughter. He wasn't that concerned with who he slaughtered. The idea of anti-Semitism was that any fascist Nazi party requires a scapegoat to blame for its failures. It does not necessarily mean if there are parallels that there has to be the Jews in this country. They were terrible victims of Hitler, but it wouldn't have to be. I'm not a political prognosticator. If you ask me, if it happened here, who would be the scapegoats in this country? Who would be the scapegoats in this country? <laughs> I think the probable likelihood is big businessmen, because... The intellectuals, the professors, the politicians blame businessmen for everything. They're the scapegoats already. And businessmen have been brainwashed in college to feel, to accept all the current ideas. Or they feel guilty of making a profit. They think it's wrong to be selfish, to pursue their own success and so on. They take these big ads in the papers saying, in effect, dear public, we made a profit, true, but we're going to give it away to the widows and orphans, most of it, and next week we'll give away even more. Please just give us a little time. These people are begging to be taken over. They're really cowards, and if it happens here, they're just ripe for the plucking. Well, the, uh, there is a, a guilt that uh, goes along with that. Uh, there's a book by, uh, a book by Hal Bronner, uh, The Acquisitive Man, yes. uh, in, in which, again, he speaks of this uh, guilt that is sort of bred into you as you uh, either earn or inherit wealth. So th that you get to a point where you have large corporations, and particularly large uh, foundations where family wealth, Rockefeller, Ford, et al., is involved, and there seems to be carried along with that some sort of a guilt about having it, and that we must somehow divest ourselves of it. Uh, and it's it's easy now to see what uh, what you're speaking of in this country, because uh, the bigger the corporation, uh, the more they're identified uh, as as an evil, as the villain, almost a satanic yeah. uh, influence. <coughs> yes, big business. Uh, and uh, the fat capitalist uh, is always depicted, and uh, he's the guy uh, that apparently everyone's going after this time. Well, the source of this is the universities, which are fanatically anti... I mean by the universities, the liberal arts social science department. They are fanatically anti-business, and more broadly anti-American. Now, the only thing I could say uh, about this point is that to some extent, businessmen are guilty in this country. I'm not a, by any means a champion of businessmen. I'm a champion of capitalism. Let's say fair capitalism as the founding fathers of this country conceived it, but not of businessmen because most of them are not champions of capitalism. You know, their idea of capitalism is special favors for big business from the federal government. That is not capitalism. You know, that's socialism for businessmen. Right. What I advocate is, gov is government hands off the economy completely. No tariff protection. No bailing out Chrysler if it can't make it on its own. No subsidies. No special protection, etc. No franchises. If you can make it by your own productive effort, fine. Then you should be proud. But if you're making it by means of taking the dole from Washington, you should feel guilty. I, I think we have a we have a lot in common, I'm afraid here. And uh, I good. before before this now was scheduled as a guest, uh, I didn't realize how much similarity we have there. We're going to talk about it. And we're going to allow our listeners to call and ask questions uh, of of Dr. Peacock. He is a man who uh, you may have gathered has some opinions. If we can just drag them out of him, uh, I think we'll have an interesting. I'm very ready. For <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, so you you drop in two six one nine seven six four is the number. I'm George Harris on sixty eight Ring Radio. 21 already, 81 degrees out there. I'm George Harris. In the studio, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, author of The Ominous Parallels. Your calls are welcome. Your questions and observations on 68 Ring Radio. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Peikoff. Yes, go right ahead. Oh, uh, he doesn't hear you yet. Just a moment. Uh, are you getting anything there? Uh, his earphones aren't working you, yet. I... Just a minute. We're going to do a little, little working around here. Oh, okay. you, you go ahead and uh, find the right knob. Anything happening there? Yes, I think so. Okay, let, let's give it a try. And if, if Hello. Yes, I can hear All you. All right. Dr. Peikoff. Yes. I have a question that I'd like to ask you and, and get your opinion on the matter. Sure. I have the thought that ultimately the authority of the Supreme Court would prevent us from falling into a Nazi type of government. Am I, is that not so? Well, it altogether depends on what principles are guiding the Supreme Court. The American system was the idea of checks and balances, and a very valuable one was that we should have a constitution, 
and that there should be a Supreme Court, this early developed in the history of the country, to judge whether or not something is or isn't constitutional. But the mechanism per se, however brilliant, can't work when the philosophy that gave rise to this country is entirely corroded. You know, when the Supreme Court is filled with uh, liberals and conservatives, when they uh, countenance all kinds of legislation, which is an absolute variance with the ideas of the founding fathers, the Federalist Papers, and the Constitution, then it obviously is not going to protect us. Take a simple example of which there are any number. We have a prohibition constitutionally against involuntary servitude. Now, if the draft is anything, it's involuntary servitude, compulsory military service, and yet that has been proclaimed to be constitutional. No words on paper and no human institution will save a country if the philosophy guiding its intellectuals is gone. And unfortunately, the, um, the university professors are declared, have declared war on the ideas of this country, and therefore we no longer can count on politicians, not even court justices. As long as we had five members of the court who did not approve uh, or, or find this form of government constitutionally, that we'd be protected, I would think. Well, no, I don't think so. Suppose we had five Hitlers on the Supreme Court. Well, that, that's unlikely. Well, <laughs> I don't know. And there's been some pretty poor people, in my opinion, on the Supreme Court. We have to look at some of their decisions. We have, we have the Supreme Court approving local censorship. Is that in accordance with the First Amendment? The fact that the court says something doesn't make it right and doesn't make it pro-American either. Well, I can't see a Hitler rising here on those circumstances. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me just say, I don't see a Hitler today, and I devoutly hope that I, it's not going to happen. But I do think the possibility exists, not because of the public. The public is terrific, and I can say that without chauvinism because I was born in Canada. The public is still in sympathy with the ideas of the Founding Fathers, but they're being betrayed by the intellectuals, and they're not being offered any choice. Uh, uh, let me clarify this before I take the next call. Uh, from what I've understood thus far, you're saying that a lot of the climate is the same, but you're not necessarily prophesying that... Uh, Similarly to the situation in Germany, someone will step forward and say, all of you come together now in my leadership and, and march lockstep. And I don't it. say that this has to happen, but I am saying if we have, for instance, an economic catastrophe, such as Germany had in the 20s, and you know we have the same ones threatening here, inflation and depression that brought Germany down. If we have those crises in a context where all the parties are saying the solution is more government, and all the intellectuals are saying service to the state is the ideal, then I'm frightened as to what would happen. Okay, let's take another call on 68 Ring Radio. Good afternoon. Hello, Dr. Peacock. This is Carl calling. Hi. I'm calling to ask uh, about the passing of Ayn Rand and if any uh, procedure was set up for her ideas and some of the writing she was doing to continue after her, her demise. Well, uh, am I allowed to give an address rather than take yes, time? Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to know anything about her ideas, magazines which carry it on, schools, courses, etc., I would suggest you just write to Box 177, Murray Hill Station, that's M-U-R-R-A-Y, Hill Station, New York City, and you'll automatically get literature on everything that's going on. Is there a zip on that? Uh, 10016, but we get so much mail, a zip isn't necessary. Okay. <laughs> Could you comment, though, just on whether or not, you know, she left some vehicle for her ideas to continue? Oh, absolutely. There are magazines carrying on her ideas. She left a quarter of the script of Atlas Shrugged TV miniseries, which I'm in process now of seeing is going to be turned into an actual miniseries, which should reach the screen in about 30 months. She's got a book coming out this fall, which I put together and wrote the introduction to. Uh, it's going to be called Philosophy Who Needs It. Uh, there's a lot of stuff still coming. Very good. Thank you, sir. I'm delighted to hear that. I, I admired her writing, and uh, a lot of people did. Uh, I think that uh, it, it was heavy, but it's hard to read through it and not say, hey, that makes sense. And uh, I hope more people would feel that way about it. 68 Ring Radio. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hi. Hi. I also am worried, as is Jerry. Okay, Jerry. The mentality of the people that keep on voting in the, the politicians on either side or both that are continuing to give away and increase taxes, and, you know, when are we going to get the mentality changed around? Well, I don't think you can say it's the people. I really don't. I don't think people have any choice. When you have a situation where government controls so much of our lives, 
and everyone is rushing to form a pressure group necessarily to try to extract what they can from the government simply to survive before their antagonists do. In a situation like that, what do you want people to do? They can't just lie down and die and let their competitors rush and get everything, so everybody has to converge on government. It's not the people's fault, it's the way the system developed thanks to the intellectuals. This went back way to the turn of the century, as I show in the ominous parallels. The progressive movement was the first main turning point to big government in the first two decades of this century. And then the New Deal came on top of that, and then the New Left, and then the New Right. And you can show that it's straight out of Harvard and Columbia and their equivalents, and you're not going to change it by, by uh, any other means than changing the complexion of ideas taught at the colleges. It's not the no. mentality of the people. Uh, I think how the did pe that happen? How does that happen? Well, what I advocate is a voluntary equal time policy by the universities, voluntary, not by government, as follows. For every hundred advocates of unreason and socialism, let them have one professor who advocates reason and capitalism. Just one to a hundred. That's all I ask for. If they would do that, I would say we have no worries about the future. But they're closed shops. They, they are simply not open to anything that violates the intellectual establishment. Okay. I, I uh, economists are this from the same school. The economists are Marx, uh, Marxists or Keynesians, which are two variations of more government. So in, in every department, they pretend to have controversies, but the controversies are over trivia and the fundamentals they can see. I might uh, tell our caller, uh, Alan Greenspan had some nice comments about you. He's chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and uh, he said Dr. Peikoff has produced an extraordinarily perceptive thesis, and uh, he says that anyone concerned with the collectivist trend in today's world should read the book. So. Uh, I I agree with the whole philosophy, but I'm, what I'm worried about is that the American people are so worried about sticking their hand out with their palm up that they don't want to carry a load. You may be right that, that we don't have the time to do that, but I'm going to thank you for, uh, for that call, and we're going to uh, have some more calls and conversation right here on 68 Ring Radio. We're with uh, Dr. Leonard Peikoff talking about his book, Ominous Parallels, but right now we're going to CBS for... He's my guest, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, the book, Ominous Parallels, 261-9764 is the number to put you on 68 Ring Radio. Good afternoon. My name is Ann. Ann? I, I'm a college student, and I don't know what you fear about conservatism. Most of my professors are very liberal. Um, one of the questions I have to ask, you mentioned uh, you, it seems to me you, you are um, calling um, right-wingers or conservatives anti-Semitic. Me? So. Oh, no, I didn't say that. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. I just wondered, if, because... Uh, it seems like most of the people on the left side, like Vanessa Redgrave, Ned Asner, they were very anti-Israel. And many conservatives I know are very uh, pro-Israel. Oh, I don't know. <clears throat> I am very pro-Israel. Yeah. Uh, I think Israel is a bastion of Western civilization in a barbaric, feudal part of the world run by dictatorships. And... Uh, that they are subject to terrorist attacks. If we had a band of people in Canada lobbing bombs over the border, I would say to hell with territorial integrity. We have every right to go in there and wipe out this type of threat, and I am a complete supporter of Israel's right of self-defense. But to take your other part of your question, I do not see much anti-Semitism uh, um, that I know about. There are groups, I'm sure, on the right that are anti-Semitic, but it's not part of their public literature. What I'm concerned about is not what people are subterraneanly, but what they say openly and publicly from the platform. We don't have to worry about, about uh, you know, people's prejudices underneath if they're sowing all the ideas that are going to lead to disaster for all of us. Yeah. Um, how about, what, what are your feelings on the PLO? completely opposed to the PLO. Absolutely. I, b I believe it's a terrorist organization, and I would be very happy if Israel would get them out of Lebanon altogether. I agree. I'll try and buy your book now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you for My the call. My book is not on that subject, <clears throat> That's right, but there's another sale. Always take okay. a sale. 68 Ring Radio. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Peacock, yes. I, uh, I essentially agree with some of the conclusions you drew, uh, that you draw from a certain set of facts, but I disagree with your... Uh, interpretation as the, the uh, conditions that existed in uh, Germany prior to the uh, rise of Adolf Hitler, and, and, and as a similar conclusion is what's happening here. By the way, I heard you on the uh, 
a talk show um, two or three nights ago, and I think you said something there that I would disagree with as far as it relates to facts and history. You well, give me a specific. I, that's what I'm getting at. You specifically said that Adolf Hitler was elected, or you intimated or in response to somebody's question that Adolf Hitler was elected to his office in Germany. He was never elected. He was appointed to the prime, to the chancellorship oh, yes. by uh, by uh, Hindenburg. Yes, I cover this in detail. I guess you haven't read the book because obviously uh, he was appointed by Hindenburg, but his party had to do very, very well in the elections yep. uh, before he could reach that stage. And in fact, I give the electoral figures. Most of my book is actually in quantity about how Hitler rose to power counting on certain philosophic ideas and what were the type of events that caused the change from election to election. So you don't have to explain that point to me. No, but I think it's, to people in the audience, there's a constant myth that Hitler was elected by the German people. But it doesn't make any difference. There were millions and millions and millions who voted for his party, who voted for him in presidential elections, and who actively supported his being appointed. So it's irrelevant whether or not he was directly elected or appointed after being widely uh, upheld. I, I disagree with your conclusion there, but let's don't hop on that, because I, 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 essentially my, my contention is that you have touched on the, the people in the university. I think you, yeah. and you might have touched on this with other uh, interviews, but I think that the media has to bear a large, large responsibility of the destruction of this country as it relates to some of the conditions that you see uh, occurring and now. I think that the well. media is a, is a uh, extension of the, uh, uh, of the people in the universities that believe in the philosophy with more, <laughs> more government. And I think that in as much as we have television and radio, their, the, the ability for the media to project their uh, uh, ideas and thoughts and to confuse people with the high technology that communications has evolved into, they, they can do a tremendous lot more damage than they could in the past. All right, let's do this. Uh, let, let me thank you for the call. I'll let him respond to that, and you go back to your radio, and we'll talk about media. Yes, in a word, I would say this. I don't hold any group primarily responsible about the colleges because... Where do the media people, or for that matter, the grade school teachers, or the priests and the ministers, or the businessmen, or all the rest, learn their ideas from? They go to college and they get educated by those professors, so the root of it is the colleges. As far as the media is concerned, certainly they are dominated by the ideas that they're taught in college. However, I don't think that's the primary problem, and in my experience, I've taken a nationwide tour now in connection with this book. I have had perfectly fair treatment from the media, especially, I may say, since I'm on radio right now, from radio show hosts who are the, about the most intellectual and the fairest people I've met, and I've gone up and down the whole country. I'm very high on the media. I think if they even knew there was another viewpoint, they would disseminate it. But, you know, they, they just get one solid pouring of ideas from the universities. They don't even know there's anything else. All right, let's take another call right here on 68 Ring Radio. Uh, yes, I'd like to know your opinion of the situation of uh, in Germany prior to Hitler on gun control. Did not the Gestapo have the guns only and not the people? I don't know. I don't believe there was gun control in Germany prior to Hitler. Uh, How I do not know. I'm sorry to Gestapo say. Gestapo went into people's homes and, uh, and took people out of their homes. Oh, that they certainly did, but that they would do whether or not people had guns, because what could you do even with a gun if a squad is standing at the door and about to take you to Auschwitz? Okay. I'm not an advocate of gun control, of course, but I, I don't make parallels on that level. My, my, I deal with, you know, broad, the broad picture. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. All right. We thank you for that call, and yeah, we're going to have some more conversation with Dr. Leonard Peikoff about his book, Ominous Parallels, 261-9764 is the number to join us for your comments and observations. I'm George Harris on 68 Ring Radio. 241 is the time. I'm George Harris talking to Dr. Leonard Peikoff about the book, Ominous Parallels. We're looking at, of course, uh, that period of history just prior to the rise of Hitler and uh perhaps, I guess, even 10, 20 years prior to his rise, yeah. and what laid the groundwork for it. You mentioned something uh, earlier, and we didn't elaborate on it much, but you mentioned uh, influences in this country, even like uh, the moral majority. How, how, much, how much of an influence, or do you see any parallels between religious movements uh, in the two situations? Oh, very definitely. 
Germany in the 20s was a hotbed of religious mystic cults. They just popped open everywhere. Hitler was one of them, Nazism. And if you look at the United States recently, the last couple of decades, the Hare Krishnas, the Moonies, astrology, ESP, there's a whole raft of them. And uh, I find this extremely dangerous because the essence of those cults then in Germany and here today is drop your mind, find a guru, obey. And, of course, the guru justifies his demands on the grounds that you're being selfless, you're sacrificing for the future, you're being, quote, idealistic. What causes it? In both countries, these kids come out of the colleges, they're, they're educated kids. It's not, you know, the so-called blue-collar uh, people that go into these, into these. They're educated, but what are they educated to? There are no absolutes. Nothing is certain but death and taxes. You can't be sure of anything. What's true for you isn't true for me. Who can know anything? They come <laughs> out completely brainwashed into skepticism. And, of course, they're ripe then for some guru to pluck them. Some of them do that. Some of them just give up altogether. Look at the phenomenon of despair on a generation-wide scale drugs. You know, when I went to school, drug taking was not a, a phenomenon across a whole generation. Yet it is now, and it was in the 20s. These are what are the products of our university and college system. There's a generation of, of bewildered, I think. And Absolutely. a lot of them were involved uh, in a lot of the uh, war movements. Uh, some now are involved in the peace movements. Uh, and they are quick to follow anyone who says, I have an idea, I have a movement, I know the way. And when you find people with a herd instinct who will respond to the leader that says, follow me, I know the way, I, I see that also as a, as a dangerous situation. Let's take some more calls on 68 Ring Radio. Good afternoon. This is Yvonne. <clears throat> Yvonne, good afternoon. Uh, I, too, am a great admirer of Ayn Rand, and I maintain that people who criticize her are people who are incapable of refuting her. You know, it's always easier to criticize and Islam, and I don't understand her position on abortion. Uh, to me, a belief on abortion on demand is equivalent of saying the fetus in is nothing. I am by no means a religious fanatic, but reason and logic tell me that the fetus is not nothing. Could you explain that to me? Certainly. You have asked two questions there, and I'd be happy to answer both briefly. <clears throat> Ayn Rand was an atheist, as am I, because she was exclusive advocate of reason. She did not believe, therefore, in any form of the supernatural, any kind of faith, any kind of mysticism. The greatest religious philosopher in history was Thomas Aquinas, and he was the leading attempt in all human thought to try to show that you could establish God in reason. Yes. By the common consensus of philosophers with which I agree, he failed. Yes. And I take the view, therefore, that religion is outside the bounds of reason, and therefore I cannot endorse it. Now I'll turn to your question of... But reason... Well, wait, we, we can't argue back and forth on every point. Let me get your other point first, which is abortion. You want to know how she was in favor of abortion? Abortion on demand. Yes, I understand. Because she made a very firm distinction between the potential and the actual, what can be and what is. The embryo or the fetus can be a human being. It has the <laughs> potential. But actual... Well, you won't let me finish, madam. You keep interrupting me. I'm sorry. It can be a human being, but actually it is simply tissue shaped and structured a certain way. So long as it is tissue parasitic on the body of another, it has no rights. At the moment that it becomes viable, it can exist on its own as an independent entity. Then I say, yes, it has rights. You can't interfere. So long as it's growing on a woman's body and the woman says, I do not want it, the woman is the actual human being, and you cannot sacrifice an actual to a potential. You can't take a real human being and say, become a slave for life to nursing something that you don't want when the thing is not actually yet a developed human being. I, I want to jump in here. I, I, uh, if the caller will bear with me for just a moment, because uh, I disagree with uh, this here uh, uh, and have to say it. When you speak of that tissue growing on the body, that seems to equate the fetus with a wart or a mole, and I, I don't think that's a fair equation. 
Well, I don't think it's a ward or a mole, but I don't think it's a human being either. What is? What would you call it? Uninterrupted. It's it will become. It's so Uninterrupted, it's, but an acorn its, is not an oak tree, It's right? on its way toward becoming That's one right. if it doesn't get squashed. But until it's become, I don't think it can dictate the terms for the mother if she doesn't want it. All right. Uh, to, Carl, you raised a good point there, and I think he's answered those. Let me let me leave you there if I will. And you stay with us and listen some more because let's take some more aspects uh, of this. And we could get bogged down on abortion alone, but uh, I know, I know we won't have time. Let's look at as much of this as we can and talk to our guest, Dr. Leonard Peikoff, 68 Ring Radio. Good afternoon. This is Bob. I would like to make the comment that, the, to me, the basic fallacies of both objectivism and, say, Marxism are that, number one, that they do not uh, include or do not take into account or do not realize that man is a cultural being, and number two, that man is not always rational. I don't even know what you mean by man as a culture being. He's a product of his culture? Marx holds that. Exactly. Ob Marx holds that. Objectivism does not. Objectivism holds that man has free will. He has a sovereign intellectual capacity. If he chooses to uh, exercise it, he can make himself what he wants. You don't have to just fit into your society. If you lived in Nazi Germany, would you say, well, what can I do? I'm a product of my culture. I just have to be the way everybody else is. I have to be a brute and anti-Semitic? Nonsense. You deny the anthropology. I deny that man is a being determined by forces outside his control. He has the power to think so long as he's not insane. So there's a complete opposition between objectivism and Marxism on that point. Now, what was your second point? I, I didn't remember the second. Well, he's point. rational. He is. He, oh yeah. He, no, I don't think man has to be rational. Uh, I think, however, that. If he's going to survive, that's his only option. But certainly men can choose to be irrational, and unfortunately, the more prominent they become politically and intellectually today, the more they choose to be irrational. Marxism, however, is not, as you imply, an advocate of rationality. What? Marxism says... Reality is intrinsically illogical, filled with contradictions. Man is a piece of meat who has no mind, and his ultimate duty is a blind obedience to a commissar. I don't regard any of this as rationality. Yes? Okay. I, I came to an end. Your turn. I can knock you down real fast, and, and this, this is an ad hominem attack, but Ayn Rand was a Jew, okay? That will knock your whole philosophy down to all the people you're trying to persuade. Oh, yeah? How do you get Are you an anti-Semite? Is that it? I'll let that comment stand for itself. Just, just well, all right, I will too then. That will knock your whole sales pitch down to the population. Well, if it if that uh, is cultural if, and that is rational, and the population will will uh, react accordingly to it. I, I, uh, do you have any idea what this gentleman is uh, trying to I, get at here? Audience decide what's going on. Okay, I, I do thank you for your call, and uh, you've raised some points that we'll talk about some more, and we invite others to join us by dialing two six one nine seven six four. I'm George Harris, 68 Ring Radio. Well, I'm George Harris, we're going right back to our phone so you can talk to our guest, Dr. Leonard Peacock, on 68 Ring Radio. I'm Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Uh, I have just, in the last several months, read a book that goes right along with what you're saying, that education does have an effect on the public's thinking and uh, whatever goes on, in not only in this country but in the world. And are you familiar with Harvard Hates America? Oh, yeah. I agree with the title of that book, Profoundly, I've never read the book, but I, I thought that was a wonderful title. And uh, that is certainly, in a, in a more general way, a key element of my thesis that the universities hate America. Not only do they hate America as it is, they hate the essence of America. They hate what made this country great, which was reason, the pursuit of your own happiness, what Ayn Rand called the virtue of selfishness and capitalism. Those ideas are anathema at the universities. They're, they're, they're just ridiculed and despised. And in that sense, I think that guy's title was really good, only it's not just hard. It's Harvard and Columbia and Yale and I'm sure Emory and Georgia Tech and you name them. Well, I think he, he chose that because that was the root of where it began. Yes, Harvard's the most it, prestigious one in the country. Yeah, yeah, and he was a student there and yeah. he went there, he found this terrible, um, these uh, philosophers being taught against capitalism and all these things that uh, made America. Oh, I could tell you some of the things about what they teach the students in philosophy at Harvard. Uh, John Rawls, for instance, is one of the professors of philosophy. 
and he preaches that uh, if you uh, create something by your own efforts, you're not entitled to it, because after all, you didn't create your own brain. You had to be born with a brain, and therefore, it's perfectly proper for the state to expropriate everything you have and give it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, Professor Quine at Harvard teaching philosophy, who's allegedly a conservative, and he's been teaching his students for 20, 30, 40 years that uh, there's no basic difference between physical objects and the gods of Homer. There isn't even an actual reality. I mean, the Harvard uh, is just a cesspool, and this is our most prestigious university. You could just predict what these, project what these colleges are doing to young, unformed minds. If you have children going to college, the most crucial thing is to watch what they're taught, to tell them to challenge their professors. Well, it's not just being taught in the college, it's being taught in the high schools, too. Sure, but the high schools were taught by the college. Uh, this is, is a result of government running our schools. No, I think the reverse. I think the government is running the schools because the colleges made us ashamed of capitalists. Well, I, I think, uh, my belief is, that since the Department of Education has become part of the United Nations, or under the United Nations, that they are teaching and controlling the thoughts of the young people in this country today. Well, I'd have to say to that, I don't think they're under the control of the United Nations. They're probably under the control of Washington. I happen to be very much against the United they Nations. Seth, I mean, not you, Seth. UNESCO, they are. Okay, listen, you've raised several things, and uh, I'll thank you for those. I want to get some more calls here, and I have to agree uh, with your philosophy on United Nations. I'm glad you dropped in today on 68 Ring Radio. Good afternoon. Yes, a comment and a question. Yes. Uh, my name is Jay. Jay. Uh, I would like to agree that I think that uh, we're presented with pretty uh, two harsh realities of the right and the left. One believes in, in financial freedom, uh, uh, economic freedom, but in... Uh, uh, social tyranny, and I think the other one believes in uh, economic tyranny, but uh, social uh, uh, freedom. So I, I think there's pretty two harsh realities. What I want to know, though, and I plan on reading your book, is what has been the driving force behind this? Why has this come about? There, there's got to be a motive. Well, yes, sir. My, my book is half about that question uh, in one word. If I had to name one person, the driving force is the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. In the 18th century, he came up with the essence of the Nazi ideas in their purest form. He said the mind is completely helpless to know anything, and that if you do anything for a personal motive, even if your motive is just the joy of having done good, you are amoral and you deserve no credit. You have to become a schmoo, you know? Uh, <laughs> Al Capp's a little character that wants to be eaten alive, he gave that to the world as the ideal of virtue. He took over all German philosophy. You know, Hegel, Marx, the whole crew came from him, and then they penetrated America, their followers, after the Civil War. Our universities started to be corrupted about 1870s, 1880s. This has been going on for a hundred years, so that by the time you get to today, these professors don't even remember their grandfathers having any ideas other than these ideas of German philosophy. That's why it's happening. It goes back a long way, and in the ominous parallels, I try to show the whole roots by which it happened. I can't uh, help but believe there's an elitist philosophy behind much of this, too, the idea that everybody else is a dumb-dumb except for me. You mean on the part of the intellectuals? Uh -huh. Well, some of them do th that, and some of them are obviously powerless, just, but unfortunately most of them are sincere, I think. They really believe this stuff that they teach. That's the threat. If they didn't believe it, I wouldn't be so worried. Uh, one rhetorical question about that caller, two, uh, I believe two calls ago. What does Ayn Rand, uh, being Jewish or not Jewish, have to do with anything? You got me. I have the faintest idea. I was born Jewish, too. I'm not religious. I don't subscribe to any ethnic... Uh, uh, you know, affiliation, but what it's got to do with anything, unless he's a racist, I haven't the faintest. Jay, I'll take another call. I thank you for your question, and we'll uh, get another one right on the air on 68 Ring Radio. Yes, Dr. Peikoff, uh, living in the South, as I have for the last couple of years, I'm in, we're down here inundated with a lot of propaganda in terms of Christianity and religion, and I'm wondering if, for everyone's enlightenment, if you would give the objectivist or your definition of what morality really is. What morality really is, morality should be, in a word, a code of rational self-interest. That means each man living by his own mind and for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself for others nor others for himself. 
respecting the rights of others and demanding that they respect his rights, living by thought, action, production, achievement. If he wants to deal with others, do it by trade when both parties mutually agree and do not expect the government to do anything but keep criminals out. The government should punish people who use physical force and fraud to violate your rights, but other than that, it should be hands-off, let's say fair. That's a, a nutshell, but read Ayn Rand's book, uh, The Virtue of Selfishness. She describes it in detail. Oh, yes, I have. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you for the call. We're going to uh, uh, kind of summarize this a little bit because we're getting up to that last minute or so of, of our show, and I would like to uh, say that uh, you're arrival here and your scheduling here uh, was fortuitous so far as I'm concerned because someone else booked you for my show but after reading your book I'm glad you came because okay. I agree with the principles that uh, that Ayn Rand uh, laid out in her works and uh, I think this extension of it and the research in this is fascinating. I, uh, I'm not here to sell books but uh, just as one more person that liked it. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. The, uh, I would I ask you one other thing. Is uh, what you would call the movement, the objectivist movement, yeah. uh, is, is there anyone leading the way at this point that you would identify, or do you fancy yourself to kind of take up the, uh, uh, the torch and carry it on? Well, with all modesty, Ayn Rand called me her intellectual heir, and she made me her legal heir, and I'm, uh, all right, I am running it. Okay, well, we'll probably hear more about you, and I hope uh, we have occasion to chat again. As we have on this show so many times, we'll continue to say, uh, so far as any personal advocacy of my own. It is educate yourself, inform yourself, trust your own mind, and make your own decisions, because there are legions of folks out there that would like to do it for you. And if you'll let them, they will rush to your door, happy to tell you how to live your life. So, uh, uh, again, trust your judgment. you got a good mind up there. Use that gray matter, uh, because uh, it will serve you well. I want you to stay tuned uh, for our, our next hour. Charles Clark uh, is going to be our guest. We're going to be talking politics a little bit. It is that time of year. We have a lot of races going on. We want you to inform yourself in a political arena as well. So thank you for this hour. Thanks to Dr. Peacock. You stay tuned. I'm George Harris. You're listening to WCNN North Atlanta. Stay tuned now for CBS News. <laughs>